Listen to The Great Gatsby, a book adaptation by Oxford Reading University. Level B1. 1. My father once told me, Whenever you feel like judging a person, remember that most people haven't had all the advantages that you've had. Ever since I was little, I tried to keep myself from passing judgment, and other people seemed to appreciate it very much. They let me into their most secret thoughts and intentions, even though I hardly ever wanted to know them. I even used to be called a politician in college, because I unintentionally learned everybody's secrets. Yet I must admit that over time my patience has reached its limit. When I came back from New York last fall, I wanted people to never again force me to look into their hearts and see their real characters. Gatsby was the only exception, even though he represented everything I tend to disrespect in a person. I was amazed by him. He had an incredible passion for life and a talent for hope. I have rarely seen that in another person, and I am unlikely to ever see that again. I come from a fairly rich family of caraways that have lived in the Midwest for generations. After graduating from Yale University in 1915, I participated in the Great War. Upon my return from the front, I was annoyed by the uneventful life of our little town. Soon I headed to New York to learn the bond business. My father was generous enough to support me financially. In the spring of 1922, I finally found myself in the big city, intending to stay there forever. Long Island consists of two parts separated from one another by a small bay, East Egg and West Egg. I rented a house in West Egg. Almost identical in shape and size, the two parts contrasted sharply in everything else. Life in East Egg was much more fashionable. It was where all the rich people lived. But oddly enough, the most impressive house on Long Island was located in West Egg, right next to mine. It was enormously big by any standard. It had a tower on one side, a yard with beautiful gardens, and a large swimming pool. I knew it belonged to someone by the name of Gatsby. 2. One evening, I drove over to East Egg to have dinner with my cousin Daisy and her husband Tom Buchanan. I remembered him from college. Back at Yale, he was known for his excellent academic performance and impressive achievements in sports. Tom was waiting for me by the front door of their house. He showed me into a large drawing room with high windows. The fresh summer breeze blew the curtains in and out of the room like giant flags. Two young women lay on the couch in the center of the room. One of them was Daisy. She rose from the couch and held out her hand to me. What a pleasure to see you again, Nick, she said with a cheerful laugh. She introduced me to her friend, Miss Jordan Baker, and we exchanged quick looks. Then Miss Baker lay back down on the couch and closed her eyes. I felt almost embarrassed that I had bothered her. A servant brought in four drinks, but Miss Baker refused sharply, saying, I'm currently in training. Daisy explained that she played golf professionally. Soon, dinner was announced, and we seated ourselves at the table in the dining room. Then, suddenly, the telephone rang, and the servant said that the call was for Tom. He left the room without saying a word, and Daisy followed him silently. I was left alone with Miss Baker and tried to start a conversation, but she said in a warning voice, Be quiet! I want to hear what they're talking about. I looked at her confusedly. Don't you know? She asked in honest surprise. Tom is cheating on Daisy with some woman in New York. Before I could understand the meaning of her words, Tom and Daisy were back. The conversation didn't go well. We suffered through the rest of the dinner. Then Miss Baker prepared to leave. I must get enough sleep before tomorrow's competition, she announced and left. Daisy looked at me and said, I think you should marry her, Nick. It's hard to think of a more suitable match. I laughed embarrassedly, indicating that I had no intention to marry anytime soon. Daisy and Tom came to the door with me and watched me get into my car. On my way home, I thought about what Miss Baker had told me. I was confused and even disgusted. Late at night, I sat in my yard. Suddenly, I noticed a lonely figure of a man in the distance, Something about his leisurely movements and confident positions suggested that he was Mr. Gatsby, and I stood up to call him. But then I changed my mind. I saw him reach out his arm toward the dark water of the bay in a curious way. 
From where I stood, I could see that he was shaking. I looked at the sea to see nothing but a tiny green light going on and off somewhere far away. When I looked back, Gatsby was gone. 3. One day, Tom and I took a train to New York. The railroad crossed a small river flowing through an unpleasant area along the highway, buried under a thick layer of dust. Only the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg watched the road from a giant advertising banner. Trains always made a stop before crossing the river. That day, as we stopped halfway to New York, Tom suddenly jumped off the train. Let's meet my girl, he said. We walked to the very edge of the dusty desert and stopped at a small garage. The sign above the door said, Repairs George B. Wilson, Cars Bought and Sold. Tom entered, and I followed him. The owner of the place was a pale, sickly man, covered in dirt from head to toe. On the stairs next to him stood his wife. She was rather ugly in the face, but every tiniest movement of her body suggested life and passion. Wilson hurried to the back room to bring some chairs. Meanwhile, Tom talked to his wife. I must see you, Myrtle, he said. Get on the train with us. All right she replied, smiling gently. Soon we arrived at Tom's apartment. I was about to leave, but Tom stopped me. Stay, he asked. Myrtle will telephone some of our friends and we'll throw a party. It wasn't long till the apartment was full of people and alcohol. It was one of the two times in my life when I got drunk. Soon, Myrtle and Tom retired to the bedroom together. Myrtle's sister sat on the couch next to me and said cheerfully, you live on Long Island too, don't you? I was at a party at Gatsby's a month ago. I grew curious at the mention of his name. He's my neighbor, I said. They say he's a close relation of someone in the German royal family, she went on thoughtfully. No wonder he's so rich. But his private life is a mystery. The party died down only around midnight. I rose from the couch to leave, when suddenly I heard loud voices talking over one another. They were Tom and Myrtle's. Daisy! 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 cried Myrtle madly. I'll say it whenever I want. Don't you ever mention my wife's name again, shouted Tom. With a sharp wave of his hand, he hit Myrtle in the face. Blood poured down from her nose and onto her fancy dress. I escaped through the door and straight to the train station. There, I caught the morning train back to Long Island. 4. Mr. Gatsby was famous for throwing big parties. Every weekend, his house was decorated with flowers and colorful lights. The guests arrived to swim in the pool and sail across the bay in his motorboat. At night, a hired orchestra gave live performances for the guests to dance to till morning. When everyone finally left, Gatsby's eight servants and an extra gardener cleared the house for another party to come in a week. Not all the guests were necessarily invited. In fact, I was one of the very few people who had received an actual invitation from the host. I walked up to his house on the appointed evening. Hundreds of people gathered in the garden to be entertained by the orchestra's incredible jazz performance. I looked for the host, but he was nowhere to be found. At the front door of the house, I ran into Miss Baker. She was the only person at the party that I knew. We sat down at a table in the garden next to a man approximately my age. Your face looks familiar, old sport, he told me quietly. Weren't you in the war? I told him I had indeed fought in France and named my division. He had been there too. We talked a little about the war and then I said, This party is so unusual. I haven't even met that Gatsby man yet. He looked a bit embarrassed. I apologize, old sport, he said. I guess I'm not a very good host. My name is Jay Gatsby. He gave me one of those hearty smiles that you only rarely get to see in your life. Then, a servant called out to him and said there was an important call from Chicago. A while later, the servant came back. Mr. Gatsby wishes to talk to Miss Baker in private, he announced to our great surprise. The servant showed her into the house. An hour passed, but Jordan hadn't returned. I went looking for her and found her and Gatsby in the library, saying goodbye. As Jordan walked past me, she said quietly, You won't believe what I just learned. Come visit me at my place sometime and I'll tell you. 
Do you like this story? Send it to your friends to enjoy it together. 5. I was spending a lot of time with Jordan Baker in New York, although I wasn't in love with her. I was attracted to her and was proud of going out with her because everyone knew she was a golf champion. But generally, she was a cold-hearted woman. I knew that at the start of her career many years ago, she even had cheated in a golf competition. One morning, Gatsby drove up to my house to pick me up for lunch. How do you like my car? He asked with excitement. His fancy yellow car must have been the most expensive one in New York. I got in and we headed to the city. Before, Gatsby had never talked about himself. To be honest, I found it disappointing and even annoying. However, that day, to my great surprise, he opened up to me. Most of the things that people say about me aren't even remotely true, he said. I don't want you to get the wrong idea of me or my past. I was born into a rich family in the Midwest and educated at Oxford. My parents died long ago and left me with plenty of money to waste. Then a horrible thing happened to me. After that, I volunteered in the army, hoping to die in the war. But instead, I fought well and was awarded many medals from many countries. He placed a small piece of iron in my hand. This one is from Montenegro, he said proudly. Then he handed me a photograph of some young students, and I recognized Gatsby among them. I keep it close to remind me of my Oxford days, he said cheerfully. In New York, we went to a restaurant where we ran into one of Gatsby's friends. Mr. Carraway, meet Mr. Wolfsheim, my dear friend, he introduced us. So, this gentleman wishes to make some business connections, the man asked me with a strange smile. I looked at him, confused. No, no, this is the wrong man, said Gatsby hurriedly. He's a friend. Oh, I'm sorry, replied the man carelessly. We had lunch together, and Mr. Wolfsheim soon left. Later, I asked Gatsby what his profession was. He may be the most successful gambler in the world, said Gatsby. Gambler? But why isn't he in prison? I wondered. The police can't prove him guilty, replied Gatsby. The man's too clever. 6. Later that day, I met Jordan Baker in a tea garden, and she finally told me about what she had learned at Gatsby's that night. Daisy and I grew up together in the town of Louisville, she began. All the officers were madly in love with her, and so was young Jay Gatsby. She spent a lot of time with him, but then he was required at the front in France. Daisy's parents never even let her say goodbye. Then she became engaged to Tom Buchanan, and after a few months, they got married. The night before the wedding, I went into her room to see her lying on her bed and crying. I knew by the sight of her that she was drunk. She had a letter in her hand. Tell them that Daisy doesn't want to marry, she cried and fell to the floor. I put ice on her face and got her into a cold bath. She never let go of the letter, and it came to pieces under the water. The following day, she married Tom Buchanan and seemed to be the happiest bride in the world. After the wedding, they spent a year in France and then moved to East Egg. That night, Gatsby told me that he had bought his house in West Egg only to be around Daisy again. Now he wishes to see her. Suddenly, a thought occurred to me. The green light that Gatsby was reaching out to the night I first saw him came from the end of Daisy's dock, I realized. He's only been throwing all those fancy parties in the hope of seeing her among his guests one day. Jordan went on, but she never comes. Now he wants for you to arrange their reunion at your place. He fears that she will reject him if he invites her to his house directly. He wants you to call Daisy over for tea and then let him come too. That's all he asks for. After so many years of waiting and buying a whole palace to be around her, I thought in surprise, noting once again that Gatsby was an incredible man. The following evening I saw a dark figure on the path in front of my house. It was Gatsby. I could see that he was very nervous. I intend to call Daisy over for tea the day after tomorrow, I told him. Would that suit you well? Yes, of course, he replied. He made an effort to sound careless, but I heard him breathe heavily. I... Listen, old sport, would you like to take a swim in my pool? I haven't taken one all summer. It's deep into the night, I replied. Well, maybe you'd like to go for a ride in my car. He asked. I need to go to bed. You're right. 
Maybe some other time, he said hurriedly. Also, do you mind if I send my gardeners over to cut the grass in your yard? I said I didn't mind. I can offer you to do some work on the side to earn some extra money, he said softly. I will make sure you won't be involved in any kind of trouble. He was obviously trying to return the favor. I knew I couldn't accept the offer, so I rejected it politely and went home. 7. It was pouring rain on the appointed day. I went into town to buy some flowers for the occasion, but they turned out completely unnecessary. Gatsby had delivered tons of flowers to decorate every room of my house early in the morning. He appeared at my door at around three, shy and embarrassed. I could tell by the dark circles under his eyes that he had had a sleepless night. Is everything well prepared for tea? he asked. I showed him into the living room where the table had already been set. An hour later, Gatsby decided to leave. She's not coming, old sport, he said. I can't wait here all day. Don't be silly, I protested. She's on her way. At that moment, we heard a car pulling up to my house, and I went to the yard to meet Daisy. I led her into the living room, but Gatsby wasn't there. After a while, a knock came on the door. I opened it to see Gatsby, pale like a ghost and all wet from the rain. He walked silently past me and into the living room. It was quiet for a while, and then I heard Daisy laughing unnaturally and saying, I am very glad to meet you again. I stepped into the room. Gatsby was standing still by the fire with his hands in his pockets. His head was resting against a big ancient clock on the shelf. We've met before, he said quietly. The clock shook under the pressure of his head and almost fell to the floor. Fortunately, Gatsby caught it with shaking fingers. I apologize, he said. He looked quite miserable. We drank tea together, and all the while Gatsby just watched Daisy with sad eyes. I hurried out of the room as soon as I saw a convenient opportunity to leave them alone. Why don't you stay? asked Gatsby in immediate alarm. I'll come back soon, I replied. I went to the yard and stood under a tree till the sky cleared. When I returned to the room, I saw that the atmosphere had changed completely. All the embarrassment had disappeared. Gatsby and Daisy sat on the couch and talked quietly. Daisy's face was wet with tears, and Gatsby's shone with happiness. I had to make a lot of noise to finally force them to take their eyes off each other and notice me. The rain stopped, I announced, much to Gatsby's pleasure. Then come over to my house, he said excitedly. I want to show you around. We set off at once. Daisy walked through the incredible gardens and into the palace, admiring its beauty. Gatsby never took his eyes off her as if trying to convince himself that she was real. In his bedroom, he opened the cupboard to show us his many expensive custom-made clothes of the finest cloth. They're incredible, exclaimed Daisy. Suddenly, Gatsby began throwing them to our feet. Daisy bent down to look at them and started crying. I've never seen such beautiful shirts before. Gatsby took us to the drawing room and asked his servant to play the piano for us to dance. Daisy took his hand in hers softly. There is a green light at the end of your dock, he told her. You can see it from here. Seemingly lost in thought, Gatsby fell silent. Now that Daisy is with him, that light doesn't matter as much to him anymore, I thought. She used to be far away, and he thought that this green light was somewhere by her side, almost touching her. Now it's just a spot. The servant played some romantic music, and they danced. I could see a slight doubt in Gatsby's eyes, as if he weren't quite certain whether the long-awaited reunion had met his expectations. He had been dreaming about Daisy for five long years, and his loving heart had created a perfect image of her. Now that he met the real Daisy, he must have felt that the image was far from the truth. 8. On Saturday, I received another invitation to a party at Gatsby's. Daisy and Tom were there, too. I noted that the usually cheerful atmosphere of the party had turned unpleasant and thought it must have been Tom's presence that caused the change. Gatsby showed them around the house and introduced them to some of his most respected guests. Tom stopped to chat with some girl. Meanwhile, Daisy and Gatsby walked to my house where they could be alone together with no strangers or loud music to separate them. 
Late at night, Tom and Daisy prepared to leave. Tom seemed annoyed. Who is this man anyway? He shouted. He must be involved in some illegal business. I'm determined to find that out. I stayed late that night because Gatsby wanted to talk to me. We sat together in the yard. He looked tired. Daisy has been upset all evening, he told me. All because of Tom. She doesn't realize that she's unhappy. She needs to leave Tom and escape with me. I'll take her back to Louisville where we first met and make her happy. You're asking too much of her, Jay, I protested. One is unable to bring back the past. Don't be silly, he laughed. I'm going to do just that. He told me about the first time he'd kissed her. It was clear that in that very moment, his dreams of Daisy had become the meaning of his life the thing that served as fuel to his ambition. I kept thinking that a woman couldn't be the only purpose of one's life. But Gatsby didn't seem to be aware of that. He did not doubt for a moment that he and Daisy would be happy together. Hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to get more audiobooks like this. 9. Soon after, the parties at Gatsby's came to a sudden end. He told me later that he had fired most of his staff. Daisy frequently visited him in the afternoons, and he didn't want his servants to talk about her too much. Several weeks later, Gatsby, Jordan, and I were invited to the Buchanan's for lunch. It was the hottest day of that summer. Tom went out of the room to get us some iced drinks. Daisy gently took Gatsby's hand and kissed him on the lips. I love you, she said. When Tom returned, Daisy suggested that we go to the city to escape from the heat and have some fun. She pretended to be cheerful, but I could see that her laughter sounded unnatural. Gatsby's eyes met hers, and they just stood there, looking at each other as if they were alone in the world. Daisy took her eyes away with an effort. Tom couldn't fail to notice that. He jumped to his feet and shouted madly, Indeed, why don't we have some fun? Let's go! Soon we were in the Plaza Hotel in New York. In the hotel room, Daisy cried out, Open all the windows! Shut up, Daisy, said Tom sharply. Can't you just ignore the heat? Your complaints only make things worse! Don't talk to her like that, old sport, said Gatsby with a note of warning in his voice. You seem to use this phrase quite often, noted Tom. Where did you pick it up? I doubt that it's commonly used in Oxford circles. As a matter of fact, I doubt you ever went to Oxford, even though you claim it so proudly all the time. Calm down, Tom, or I'm leaving, said Daisy seriously. I went to Oxford to stay there for five months, said Gatsby slowly. As a military officer, I was allowed to go to any university in England. I suddenly felt very proud of Gatsby. Tell me, Mr. Gatsby, are you trying to destroy my marriage? Asked Tom suddenly. He's not doing anything of the sort, cried Daisy helplessly. Your wife never loved you, said Gatsby, confident like never before. She has always loved me. She only married you because I was poor. Daisy, tell him that you never loved him. I don't care what happened in the past. Daisy loved me when we got married and has loved me ever since, said Tom with his eyes fixed on Daisy. She just stood there looking miserably at Gatsby. Isn't it enough that I love you now? She cried. It wouldn't be true to say that I didn't love Tom. I love you, but I loved him too. Gatsby looked at her confusedly. That's right, old sport, said Tom with a smile. Daisy isn't leaving me for anyone, certainly not for a criminal who does illegal business and should be in prison. I can't take it anymore, Tom, said Daisy miserably. Take Mr. Gatsby's car and go home, said Tom. We'll be right behind you. Soon afterward, we got into Tom's car and drove down the dusty road, straight toward the horror of death. 10. Tom slowed down his car as we were passing Wilson's garage. A crowd of people had gathered there. We saw a police officer at the door. From him, Tom learned that Myrtle Wilson had been hit by a yellow car, driving from New York at full speed. We hurried inside the garage to see Myrtle's dead body on the work table. Wilson sat beside her with his head in his hands, crying. We returned to the car and Tom drove on, crying silently. That coward Gatsby! he said. He never even stopped his car. When we arrived at the Buchanan's, we saw that the lights had already been turned on. Daisy's back, guessed Tom and turned to me. I'll call for a taxi to drive you home, Nick. 
Do come inside and have some dinner. I refused politely and went outside. I would be unable to stand any more of the Buchanans that day. Halfway through the yard, I ran into Gatsby who had stepped out into the path from the dark. He asked me whether there was any trouble on our way. A woman has been killed, I said simply. I thought as much, he said. I wanted to turn the wheel, but you weren't driving? I guessed at once, and he grew nervous. Daisy was, he admitted. But obviously I won't let anybody know. I'm going to stay here and watch the window of her bedroom. I want to be here if her husband gets violent and hurts her. I'll go check on them, I said, and headed back to the house. I found the Buchanans sitting together at the table in the dining room. Tom was saying something to Daisy quietly. His hand rested on hers, and they both seemed worried. But they were worried together, and I knew they were going to be fine. I returned to Gatsby and tried to persuade him to go home and get some sleep. I'm staying till Daisy goes to bed, he replied in a determined voice. Good night, old sport. And there I had to leave him alone, watching over nothing. 11. I hardly slept at night. At sunrise, I went to Gatsby's house. He was standing in the living room, dressed in the same suit that he had worn the previous day. I waited there till four in the morning, and nothing happened, he told me. You must leave, I said sharply. If the police find your yellow car, they'll arrest you. I couldn't possibly leave now, old sport, he replied carelessly. I must know what Daisy is going to do. That morning, he told me the truth about his past. James Gatz was the son of two unsuccessful farmers living in an old farmhouse in North Dakota. But in his dreams, he was the rich and ambitious Jay Gatsby. One day, a private boat appeared on the beach near James's farm. It was owned by Dan Cody, a successful businessman. James sailed up to the businessman to warn him against the upcoming storm. He introduced himself as Jay Gatsby. The man seemed quite impressed by the young man's sharp mind and ambition and took him along on his journey. Cody had grown attached to Gatsby. He taught him the pleasures of living in luxury. After his death, Gatsby was determined to become rich and successful. Then he told me about how he had fallen in love with Daisy. They spent one month together before he was called up to the front in France. Daisy promised to wait for him, but she was a young girl that needed a man to take charge of her life. Tom Buchanan, a gentleman of solid social position, turned out to be that man. Daisy, encouraged by her parents, agreed to marry him and was grateful that her future had been decided. When Gatsby returned from Oxford, she had already become Mrs. Tom Buchanan. I'm convinced that she never loved him, he said. Maybe she did a little when they just married, but even then she loved me more. The sun had already risen when I stood up to say goodbye and head to work. We shook hands. I hated to leave him alone. I'll telephone you, I said. Thank you, old sport, he replied. I think Daisy will telephone too. I walked all the way to the front gate, then turned sharply and shouted across the yard, They're all horrible people! You're worth the whole lot of them! I'm glad I said that. I'd never said any other pleasant words to him. He smiled at me softly and waved goodbye. That same early morning, Wilson was standing at the window in his garage. He had spent a whole night crying over his wife. His eyes were fixed on the giant banner with the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. His lips moved silently, saying, God sees everything. In the afternoon, Gatsby asked his servants to deliver all the telephone messages to his swimming pool. Then he went to the yard to take his first swim of the summer. He failed to notice the figure of a man coming close to him with a gun. I hurried back to Gatsby's right from the office. Together with his servant, we came to the swimming pool. There, we saw his swimming mattress move in circles through the surface of the water, carrying his dead body. As we took him back to the house, the servant noticed another dead body in the grass nearby. Wilson had shot Gatsby and then himself. 12. In the following days, Gatsby's house was filled with police officers and journalists. I was the only person to disprove all the many false stories about him and answer the practical questions relating to his past life. I telephoned Daisy right after we discovered Gatsby's body in the pool. 
However, it turned out that the Buchanans had left that afternoon, without leaving an address or any other contact. Except for me and a few servants, the only person who came to Gatsby's funeral was his father, Henry C. Gatz. He was very impressed by Gatsby's house. Jimmy did very well here in the East, he told me. I'm very proud of him. We talked about his son's early years. His father showed me Gatsby's old diary, where he kept a record of the time he spent on daily physical training and self-education. Jimmy was meant to be a great man, his father said proudly. It was pouring rain on the day of the ceremony. The four of us stood by the grave, and not one of the hundreds of guests that used to attend Gatsby's parties came to say their last goodbye. Daisy never sent a single flower or a short note. After Gatsby's death, I couldn't stand the life of the East anymore and was determined to return to the Midwest. One day in October, I ran into Tom Buchanan on the street. He held out his hand to me, but I refused to shake it. What's the matter? He wondered. You know that I think you are a disgusting man, I said simply. Tell me, what was it that you said to Wilson that day? He looked at me confused. I only told him the truth, he said after a while. He came to my house with a gun, prepared to kill. I told him that the yellow car was Gatsby's. Why do you care for him so much? That man was a liar, Nick. He lied to you and Daisy, and he was cruel enough to not even stop his car after he'd killed Myrtle. I couldn't bring myself to tell him that wasn't the truth. I realized that Tom Buchanan strongly believed he had done the right thing. He was careless, and so was Daisy. They could mess things up or destroy people's lives without feeling guilty. They knew that their money would guard them against any trouble to come afterward. Eventually, I shook hands with him, not having any reason to refuse him anymore. On my last night in West Egg, I returned to Gatsby's empty house to look at it one last time. I looked across the bay, thinking about Gatsby's dream. He watched the green light at the end of Daisy's dock and dreamed of reaching it one day like the Dutch sailors who first saw the green shores of the undiscovered new world. He believed in his dream, not knowing that it had long since been dead. For more English books for all levels, check out appava.com. And now, watch this video. It will help you improve your English right now.